Welcome to another episode of Eberhard Outdoors. This one's gonna be part three of the scent control series that I'm putting out. And this one's gonna have a lot of hands-on stuff. I'm gonna show you clothes, I'm gonna show you washing machines, soaps, clothing, aiders, sticks, stuff that has to be washed and cared for in order for you to have a scent control regimen. And I've been doing this for a lot of years. Been bow hunting for over 50 years. Got 52 book bucks, 30, Two from Michigan, which is the most heavily pressured state in the country, bow hunting wise. Uh, everything I do is on either public or knock on doors for free permission properties or walk ons out of state. So uh, I feel like I have the right to speak about what I'm going to talk about because I've been doing scent control for properly for 21 seasons. The first two years it was touch and go, I was learning the process. And in pressured areas where I hunt, mature bucks are far and few between. And you have to be creative and you have to do things different than the competition. Otherwise, there's no reason to expect any different results than they have if you're hunting similar to them, unless you just feel like you're luckier. And I can typically see somebody, I can look at their vehicle, I can look at their hygiene, and I can tell without saying a word if they're capable and detail oriented enough to actually have a scent control regimen. Now that's a crude thing to say, uh, but in my personal opinion, I, I think I can tell that just by meeting somebody. Sometimes I'm wrong, but typically that's been the case. Basically you have to be detail oriented to have a good decent scent control regimen that will work. And keep in mind, there's been millions and millions of deer killed without a scent control regimen, just hunting the wind. I did it for years. I did it for 35 years and uh, I shot some nice bucks. I've killed a lot bigger bucks and a lot more of them consistently and a lot more consistently since, since switching to a saddle and then again going to scent control uh, in 1999 when I started doing it properly using scent lock. I've shot a lot more. I've been way, way more consistent, seen many, many more deer have deer downwind to me all the time because I don't pay attention to wind. So when I go in hunting, there's just a, there's a 50-50 chance that deer is going to come in from downwind as it is upwind because I pay zero attention to wind when I go hunting. I hunt a spot for the time of season it's supposed to be hunted, for the time of day it's supposed to be hunted. I just go in and I hunt it. I don't worry about the wind and that's a big, big deal. I manage properties and lightly hunted areas, you know, like a lot of the, <laughs> obviously the TV guys do. And there's a lot of people now that have big, private managed properties where they pass on, on bucks. And in those types of areas, you can get away without having a good scent control regimen because you're usually on the property, you're on there with tractors, you're planting food plots, you're out there putting in minerals and, or whatever the case may be. And because there's so many bucks and they don't get targeted until they hit the kill status, three, four years old, they've grown up tolerating human intrusions without any negative consequences. So on managed and lightly hunted areas, like where we go to Kansas and Iowa and even in Missouri, you know, I drop my guard big time. It's because there's so many mature bucks and they move a lot more during daylight hours and you can just get away with a lot more mistakes. You just can't get away with the mistakes in pressured areas. And I'm not talking just Michigan. I'm talking there's a lots of states, West Virginia, Virginia, New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. There's, there's areas in most every state that gets a lot of heavy hunting pressure. But the farther west you go, the less you have of that. Uh, you get out into Iowa and Kansas, and even the public lands don't have a spot for hunting pressure compared to, to the east. So a lot of hunters like to look cool. You know, I'll never forget, uh, I'm a sales rep in the hunting industry, and I can remember in 1993, maybe it was 1994, I was repping Golden Eagle Archery, which was en ended up getting bought by Bear Archery. And I went in a store, it was an archery shop, and I walked in and Golden Eagle was the first, Golden Eagle did a lot of innovative things in their day. They were the first ones to have magnesium risers with holes cut out. You know, everything prior to them was solid. Uh, they were the first company to have a seven inch brace height bow. Before that, everything was nine inches. Uh, they were the first company to dip bows in a, a camel pattern, you know, like a real tree or mossy oak. And I can remember walking into a shop and as soon as I walked in the door, I had two bows in my hand and they were dipped bows. So they looked like the bows you see today. Prior to that, everything was blotched camel on a bow. And 
I had the guy standing at the register. He was literally 20 feet away from me. And he saw the bow, and it was the same pattern that he had on his hunting clothing. I think it was a real true advantage. And he yelled out to me, he said, I don't know who you are, because he was just a salesman, he wasn't the owner, he's not the guy I was going in to see. He said, I don't know who you are, but I want one of those bows. And I just laughed, and I said, well, why would you want one? You don't even know what it is, for God's sake. Why would you want one of these as I was walking closer? He said, because it matches my, my camouflage that I wear hunting. Think about that. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. That camo doesn't help that man kill anything, but he wanted to look cool. And I see so much of that now. You know, there, there's so many of these name brands, I'm not gonna name them, but they have these cult followings and everybody just wants to look cool. You know, like me right now. I'm wearing this for a reason. These are $700 prescription sunglasses. This is a relatively expensive citizen's watch. This is an icebreaker merino wool, 100% merino wool sh dress shirt. Icebreaker, hands down, is the best merino wool company in the world. They make base garments, they make everything. They make dresses, they make coats, they make long jackets, and it's all merino wool. So this is a very expensive, this is probably a $200 dress shirt from Icebreaker. These are brand new 511 pants that I just bought. They're really cool looking. They got lots of cool looking features. They look awesome. I saw a guy wearing a pair uh, in Oklahoma, actually, uh, when I was down in Oklahoma for a show, and I just liked the way they looked. So I ordered a couple pairs, and they're expensive, but they're really cool looking pants. Now, if I'm just walking around casually, I want to look cool. I try to look cool. I'm 71 years old. I try to look as cool as I possibly can, which is hard to do at 71 years old. But my point is, when you're deer hunting, you want things with technology. You want to use whatever has the best technology to help you advance your skill set, to help you advance your, your kill numbers, to give you more opportunities. Um, I, I just don't understand people wanting to look cool when they're hunting. You know, it's like they want to look like Rambo. I remember when the Rambo bow first came out from PSE. Everybody had to have a Rambo bow because it just looked cool. Well, that doesn't help you kill squat. You know, to me, and there's going to be a lot of guys that shun this and say I'm an idiot, and that's absolutely fine. But just keep that in mind. When you're buying things for hunting, don't buy them because they look cool. You know, when you're buying something for saddle hunting, uh, don't buy it because it's one ounce lighter than something else. You know, a couple of ounces is not going to hurt you on an entry. Uh, buy stuff that functions the best. Buy stuff with the best technology. You can do more stuff out of a saddle than you can do out of a tree stand. It's not even, a, it's not even close, the differences in what you can do. I'm not even going to go into that again. And you can definitely get away with tons of stuff, because I pay zero attention to wind direction when I'm using scent lock and I'm using everything else in conjunction with it to help me be 96 to 99 percent scent free. You know, am I going to be a hundred percent? No, but I just don't get winded. Deer will tolerate small, minute parcels of human molecules floating around in the air because most deer live in areas where there are humans, you know, in the section. So there's small, there, there's always some semblance of human molecules in the air. So, and plus, as soon as, anytime you're, let's say I'm 98 percent scent free and my 2% two, two of my odor passes through, comes out of, into my sleeve, comes out up at the neck or around the waist area at the bottom of my pant legs, that small a percentage, a deer just thinks you're too far away. Uh, they don't even think about it. I have deer cross my routes and walk down my routes all the time. Take advantage of the technology where you don't have to pay attention to the wind. You'll see a lot more deer. You'll get a lot more shot opportunities, especially if you live in a pressured area. If you live in an area where it's heavily pressured and there's very, very few, if any, mature bucks on the public land you're hunting, I'm suggesting you really think about it and try to take advantage of something that's going to help you for the rest of your hunting career. Don't buy stuff just to look cool. Man, this has a cool pocket. Look at these pockets. It's got a pocket there, it's got a little side pocket there. It's got that there. You wanna know how often I'm gonna use those? Never. As far as function, to me they're worthless, but they look cool and I'm wearing it as casual wear. 
This has this cool little pocket up here with a button on it. Looks cool. Looks nice. Am I ever going to use it? No, but it looks cool. It's casual wear. You know, the glasses look cool. Got this little thing on the back to hold them up. So, uh, you know, if you're just out casually walking around looking, trying to look nice is a good thing. But uh, for hunting, uh, spending lots and lots of money on stuff with no technology just to look cool and, and walk around and show off everybody you got this nice, expensive, cool looking stuff. Hey, you know, if that's your thing, go for it. I've even got Hey Dude shoes on. You know, they're, they're the thing right now. Hey Dude shoes, they, weigh, they don't weigh squat and they're very comfortable. Um, but anyway, this is the beginning of part three uh, in my scent control regimen. And this one's going to be way more in depth. The other ones I was sitting in a chair and just blabbing, uh, just talking about stats and technology and deer, deer senses and smells and olfactory sensors and, you know, stuff like that. And uh, this one here, I'm actually going to be showing you goods and showing you how to take care of stuff. So... Bear with me. Sometimes I come across as an egotistical ass, uh, but I promise you it's not because I am an egotistical ass. I just get beat up a lot by a small percentage of people, and sometimes I have to be an egotistical ass. I have to stand up for myself. Otherwise, they'll just push me around, and I won't say what I want to say to hunters that really need help and really can take advantage of something to make them more successful. So anyway, this is part three. This is the opening of part three, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for watching. Okay, this one's gonna be kind of simple. This is a regular washer and dryer, household washer and dryer. This one's a Whirlpool, this one's a GE. Uh, this dryer gets up to about 150, 155 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, commercial dryers actually deadsorb clothing better because they get up to 170, 175, you know, like in a laundromat or something. But these are fine. These will do the job. Uh, actually, anything over probably 90 degrees would do the job to just deadsorb. We're not reactivating. You cannot reactivate activated carbon to its pristine state in a dryer. It has to be heated to 1450 degrees Fahrenheit under pressure with no air, no oxygen. So. This is not used to reactivate, so don't ask me a question. Well, you can't reactivate activated carbon to its pristine state. No, you can't, but you don't need to for deer hunting situations. And this gets plenty warm enough to do it otherwise, just for deadsorption. It's like a sponge. It gets so much water in it. This here is what brings it out and opens up the pores, gets rid of a lot of the molecules. They break free. They go out the dryer and breaks those free and they're gone and so it opens up the pores for more more hunting. Basically I use the washer just for washing towels that I'm going to be using for drying off after I shower. You know I'd like them to be as scent free as possible. It's not that big a deal if, if you don't do that you can use a scented towel to wipe off after you take a shower with scent free detergent or scent free soap and shampoo. Uh, but this is also used for washing the towels that I use to dry off with. It's also used for washing all of my undergarments, my layering garments, all of my non scent lock waterproof garments, which is Rivers West. Again, this here is for washing clothing, undergarments, not scent lock. You do not wash scent lock. So it's for washing undergarments, my waterproof stuff, and for my towels. And then just to give you a little bit of a, I had this all in a different video, but I'm going to show it briefly again, but it's on another video in full if you need to know. Uh, these are three different laundry detergents. Obviously, this one's a sporting goods uh, company, Dead Down Wind, and these here are sold in little bitty pods. You know, it's kind of just like you can buy for dishwashing soap or laundry detergents and these are scent free pods or you can just buy real inexpensive Purex, Arm & Hammer, Tide every detergent company that makes this stuff for these guys as well uh, they offer a free and clear free and clear right here no perfumes free of perfumes and dyes and these are for people that have allergies so it's, it's a hypoallergenic detergent so there's no perfumes no dyes in it and it's scent free 
And these are the companies, the same companies that make the stuff for the hunting companies as well. They just put it in different packages and charge you about five times as much. So that's Arm & Hammer. That's actually my favorite. I don't know why. It's got a little bit, it just smells a little cleaner to me. This is Purex. And again, that's Dead Downwind, HS, Hunter's Specialty. There's a lot of companies. I think the Primo's makes a, a laundry detergent. And then you get into dead downwind body and hair soap there's dead downwind bar soap and I think you pay probably about eight bucks for that or you can buy Dove hypoallergenic no perfumes no dyes unscented soap you can buy six bars of this in a Walgreens or CVS for like ten bucks eight to ten dollars six bars here for 10 bucks at the most one bar here for probably eight to ten dollars for one bar you do the math pretty simple and this stuff works good too uh basically this is just a liquid form of soap and shampoo and you can shampoo with this or this as well and then as far as the odorants and a purse print there's the hunting brand again uh dead down wind I think if I were going to buy hunting brands, Dead Downwind I think is the best. Dead Downwind actually sells some of their stuff to other companies that they rebrand as well. But Dead Downwind does not make their own soaps and stuff. They get it from other companies like Palmolive or whoever. I'm not saying they buy it from Palmolive, but that's the mother companies that supply hunting manufacturers. They don't have facilities where they make this stuff. And then you've got antiperspirants so you got this is dry idea here's another dry idea and if you look real close right there you can see it says unscented so it's the same deal it's for people that have allergies so there's no perfumes no scents in those so it's no different than this it's just a lot less money this is probably five or six bucks these are about three i'm not trying to destroy the hunting company they'll survive just fine <laughs> but uh, same deal with scent wipes. I use scent wipes a lot. Uh, I typically buy Huggies or Pampers brand. And everything's going to this non-plastic. So now they all come in these little baggy type containers with an opener on the top. I used to like the hard plastic ones. I actually save those and I'll take these out and put them in a hard plastic one. But this is the way they come nowadays, most of them. Or you can buy unscented wipes from dead down wind or again hunter specialties i think primos offers them lots of companies offer this stuff uh, but you're gonna pay four dollars here and there are 56 wipes in this bag there's 20 wipes in this bag here and this is going to probably cost you 12 bucks so you got 12 bucks here for 20 maybe 10 dollars uh you got 56 wipes here for probably four dollars again you do the math if you're looking to save some money and then also you know these have a peel and seal where you can open this up and pull one out at a time well there's a easy cure for that because you don't want to carry this with you in your backpack when you want to wipe down your face before you put on your head cover with drop down face mask or wipe your hands before you put on your something lot gloves to change your clothes with um, so what I do is I'll just get a quart, everybody's got these at home, Ziploc quart freezer bags. You get Make sure they're the freezer bags, they're heavier plastic than a sandwich bag. And just put a bunch of wipes in there. They fold down really thin, so it's real easy to store them in a backpack. So I get these questions quite a lot. Yes, my wife uses scented detergent and she uses fabric softener that has an odor <laughs> a huge odor to it and she uses dryer sheets i'm shocked there's not one in there right now actually uh so yes you do have to you don't have to but it would help if you kind of cleaned out your dryer before you deabsorb your scent lock so what i will typically do and it works out about right when it gets to the point where I need to deabsorb one or two suits, what I will typically do, I'll probably by that time have some towels that I need to wash as well, 
or I'll have some undergarments that need to be rewashed in scent free detergent and put back in their appropriate tote. So I, what I'll do is I'll wash those in scent free detergent in the washing machine and then I'll take the towels out or the clothes, undergarments, whatever, and I'll run them through a dryer cycle and they clean out the dryer. Now on my undergarments, you know, if they have a minute bit of odor on them, it's not a big deal because they're underneath the scent lock suit. And the scent lock suit, as long as it's your exterior garment, what you have underneath it's really irrelevant. It'll absorb everything, pretty much 90, I'd say 98, 99% of everything, any odors from your clothing or from your emitted from your body that's underneath the actual exterior scent lock suit. So, on this, and I'm going to pull this camera a little bit closer because this, the top here is kind of important. Now this is a relatively standard dryer. It's got a power button. It's got a start button. It's got a pause button. It has a vent here to clean, clean out your vent. And it has several settings up here. It's got a heavy duty, normal, casual, delicates, which is usually for like permanent press. So what you need to do, it also down here at the bottom, it has a time dry, a quick dry, and a touch up dry. Now most dryers have a time dry, and that's what you're going to want your setting at. Because when you set this thing on time dry, and you hit power, it had, this one here goes on automatically for 40 minutes, and I can adjust that. I can make that higher if I want, or lower. But I like 40 minutes, that's why it's set at 40 minutes. And then right here, I don't know if you can see it, but this is the temperature. So when you have a time setter, time dry setting, you can change your temperature. So you can go air only at high, which is what you want it for, for deabsorbing scent lock clothing. It's got a medium low and an extra low. Now I use air only once in a while. Once in a blue moon, I will actually wash a scent lock suit if it's got a lot of dirt on it. If, I, if it's got a lot of mud or blood on it, and it's pretty rare I have blood on it because I usually go change my clothes before I actually dress a deer out. But once in a while I'll get blood on it when I'm blood trailing a deer after a kill before I go actually get the deer out of the field. Um, and when I do wash them because there's several different types of fabric in a suit, um, once it comes out of the washer and I run it on a light cycle in the washer, and again this maybe once every two years I'll wash a suit. I'll air dry it first. So I'll throw it in the dryer, just let it air dry, you know, where there's no heat in it whatsoever, and then one, it takes a long time. It, by the time it gets dry, then what I'll do is I'll put it back in again, and I'll run it on high for 40 minutes, and that's what actually deabsorbs the um, activated carbon. And the way that works is the deabsorption process uh, the, the heat actually energizes the molecules and the molecules start moving more rapidly and they break, a per, certain percentage of them break free from the uh, pores of the activated carbon and exit out the dryer vent. It's the exact same molecular motion you get on concrete highways and steel bridges where there's expansion joints. Every concrete highway has expansion joints and every steel bridge has expansion joints and when it's 80, 90 degrees on a nice sunny day, if they didn't have those expansion joints, the concrete highways would buckle because the concrete, the molecules in the concrete start moving more rapidly, which makes them expand. And if they didn't have expansion joints, natural molecular motion would cause the concrete to buckle. It would cause the steel, I don't care how big the steel was, the natural process would cause it to bend. So it's the exact same process that deabsorbs this is the process that makes is the reason why there is uh, expansion joints in steel bridges and concrete highways. It's the exact same process and that happens at 80, 90 degrees. This gets up to 150 degrees and a commercial dryer again gets up to 170, 175. So anyway that's the setting you're going to want it on most of the time for deabsorption is your timer setting and then Put it over here and change it up to high, whatever high is on your dryer.
I have a new suit coming out. It's called a signature saddle suit from Scentlock this year. And again, I have not been on Scentlock's payroll ever. So they don't pay me, never have. I've endorsed it because it works and I, it helps other hunters. It helps hunters become better killers. They get just more opportunities because they see more deer. They don't have to worry about wind. But this new saddle hunter suit has a polyurethane membrane in it. And several of their other suits have polyurethane membranes in them too. Anything that's waterproof or windproof is going to have a polyurethane membrane in it. If it's water resistant, it will not. If it's wind resistant, it will not. But if it's windproof or waterproof, it will have a polyurethane membrane in it. And for polyurethane membrane clothing, which the Saddle Hunter suit will be, what I would do, or what I have done in the past, because I've owned suits similar to this from Scentlock with polyurethane membranes, I turn the suit inside out. So when I bring it in the house, you know, the camo's on the exterior, I turn, pull the arms inside out, and I pull the legs inside out, and I run it for like 40 minutes where the suit is turned inside out because the carbon's on the inside of the polyurethane membrane. So the, the carbon's closer to, close to your body, and then you get the polyurethane membrane and then the exterior fabric. So by turning the suit inside out, it gets more direct heat on the actual activated carbon, which helps the deadsorption process. It actually gets hotter on the inside of the suit that way. Then once, once that 40 minutes is done and that carbon is deadsorbed, then I flip it back the other way, back to its original state. And if it was wet, if I was hunting in it during the rain because of the polyurethane membrane and the exterior was wet, Odds are really good that because I had the suit turned inside out that the exterior fabric is not totally dry yet. It's still going to have damp areas because the heat doesn't go through that membrane very well. So I'll run it another 10 minutes after I've turned it back out to its original form with the camo on the exterior and run it for 10 minutes just to make sure the exterior fabric is dry as well. So that's something to keep in mind with any scent lock suit when you're going to deadsorb it if it's got a polyurethane membrane which like the wind brace does the hydrotherm does there's several suits that have polyurethane membranes in them um, you need to flip them inside out when you deadsorb them and then for 40 minutes and then turn it back the other way around and do it for 10 more minutes if the exterior is wet but i hope that cleared things up as far as washer and the dryer and again my wife uses Scented detergent, dryer sheets, no big deal. You don't have to have a separate washer. You don't have to have a separate dryer. Uh, that is definitely not a necessity. There were a couple things I forgot to mention when I was upstairs in the washroom. Um, they're on one of the YouTube videos we did where I was washing uh, aiders and stuff. And so I just thought I'd show you. I have a wash tub up there next to the washing machine, which most people have a large wash tub. And for washing your saddle, uh, your ropes, uh, your aiders on your sticks, uh, your wristband that you have on your release, uh, bino straps, knee pads, your strap, your HYS strap. If you're using an HYS strap on public land for your accessories, that's a strap. Anything that's fabric, that needs to be washed in scent-free detergent. And a wash tub is the only place you can do that because you can't throw that stuff in the washing machine and you sure can't put it in a dryer. So just put, a, put some warm or hot water in a wash tub, uh, you know, so deep, just enough to cover up your aiders on your sticks or whatever, uh, or whatever it is you need to wash. And then just at the saddle, throw your saddle in there, throw all your ropes in there. And then just swish the raw water around every 20, 30 minutes and leave it in there for a day if you want. It's no big deal. And then after it's been in there for a long time, because it takes a long time for soap to penetrate nylon strapping, especially if it's relatively new. And I would almost guarantee nobody that I'm talking to does that currently. So it's something that probably needs to be done and it's never been done. So it's going to take a while for that soap to penetrate through that nylon strap. So leave it in there a while. And then, uh, you know, empty the soap water, put it, you know, regular water in there and rinse it out a couple of different cycles of just, just regular water. Put warm water in there, rinse everything off, uh, drain it, do it again, do it several times, and then take all your stuff outside and let it hang, you know, put it out on a branch, uh, wherever you got. I'm sure everybody's got someplace outside they can hang things. 
So I'm talking stuff like this. These are one sticks. These are tethered one sticks. Hands down the best sticks on the market. There's nothing remotely close to as good as these that are kind of pricey, but they're awesome. Uh, I've got single step aiders on these. And on the bottom one, I've got a double step aider. And I also paint these. I'm gonna bring these up a little bit closer so you can see they're painted. Uh, they have a little bit of a sheen when they're new because they're made out of titanium and they're kind of a gray color. And a lot of people put stealth strips on these. You shouldn't use stealth strips if you're trying to do a scent control regimen because stealth strips are fabric and you handle them with your bare hands from time to time and so they're, they're porous. Anything that's fabric is porous and anything that porous holds odors. It's not something you can wipe down. It's, so if you paint your sticks, you can just wipe them down with a, uh, you know, a scent-free wipe and, and you're good to go. Same with your cameras, you know, your camera straps. You know, if you're using straps on, for cam motion cameras, they need to be washed as well. Uh, and then wipe your camera off with, with a scent-free wipe before you actually hang it. So wash all your straps, bino straps, bino bags. A lot of people carry those bino bags in front of them. I don't carry binos, but uh, I do have some 8x25 Meoptas, which are probably the best 8x25 made. Um, but, you know, make sure anything that's fabric, always keep that in mind when you're doing something scent control, anything that's fabric and porous that you handle with your bare hands from time to time, uh, that needs to be washed before season. And as long as you handle it with your scent lock gloves on, beyond the time you wash it, you know, when you've got it in your vehicle, you put it in with scent lock gloves and when you take it out of the vehicle to go hunting, you take it out with your scent lock gloves on. So if you, as long as you're doing that, you're okay. So that goes with your aiders, wipe your sticks down. Again, your HYS straps, if you're using any kind of a strapping, uh, wash that as well. Leave it sitting there for a while. Uh, knee pads, take the whole knee pad, stick the whole knee pad in there. Ain't gonna hurt it. You know, leave it in there for a while, let it dry. Straps on your on your platforms. A lot of you guys are plat. I don't never use platforms. I have no reason to use a platform. Uh, but anyway, if you're using a platform, the straps that are holding your platform on the tree, they need to be washed as well. Anything that's a strap made out of nylon, anything that's porous, needs to be washed and it needs to be kept clean throughout the season. Saddle, all your saddle ropes, anything like that. Something else I kind of forgot when I was upstairs. If you want, like if you go on a trip, uh, this one here happens to be a scent lock, Oz. So this is a little ozone machine. And I use this on the inside of my van. I do not use these on clothing. Uh, scent lock says you can, as far as, you know, your undergarments and stuff. I would never ever even, cons I don't care what scent lock says, I would never consider using an ozone machine on my scent lock clothing. The dryer does a phenomenal job and that's all you need. I have 100% proof, positive, 20 years of it, that the dryer works. Uh, ozone machines definitely leave an odor. They definitely have their own odor. So I don't like to use anything on anything in my scent lock, anything to do with my scent lock clothing that has an odor in but as far as cleaning out your, the inside of your vehicle before season, you turn this on, you just set it in there, take everything out, because uh, this will fry elastic and rubber and stuff, it's not good for it. Uh, and just run this for 30 minutes, a couple cycles of 30 minutes, and it'll definitely clean out your, van, your vehicle, truck, whatever. Now, when you get in the vehicle after you take this out, it's gonna have that ozone odor, but it won't take very long if you roll the windows down and open the back hatch or whatever. Yeah, to that for that to dissipate and they say if you use an ozone machine in like an ozone closet for your undergarments and stuff that it will kill and I know it does that is that's a proven technology ozone I don't know if it kills or manipulates the molecules but anyway it gets rid of the human odor aspect of it but it does have an ozone odor so it leaves an ozone odor but over time that will dissipate as long as it's kept out in the air I can't imagine it would dissipate very fast if you took your clothes as soon as they were out of an ozone dryer and put them in an airtight container because then that odor wouldn't have any place to go. But I don't know because I don't use it. I've never had a reason to use this. So I use this in my vehicle to clean it. 
I don't use it for anything on any of my garments, but Scentlock says it's okay to use this to clean up your undergarments. But I personally would not use it on my Scentlock clothing. No way. Now, when you take your clothes out of the dryer, when we were upstairs, we were talking about uh, deabsorbing your clothing in the dryer, putting on the highest heat setting the dryer has. Once the dryer stops, and you've deabsorbed your Suntlock clothing, it comes right out of the dryer and goes into an airtight tote. Now there's many types of airtight totes. This here is a tote that Suntlock used to sell. They don't sell these anymore. Uh, I, I believe this was made by a company named Iris, and I these are still available online for like 40 bucks a piece. Uh, so they're not that expensive. Here's a couple other items. Uh, this one's not available anymore. But these, are, these types of bags are available everywhere. This here is just an airtight bag. Something you can put clothing in. It's got a membrane in it. It's got, this one here is actually plastic lined. And you just put your clothes in there, roll it up. Snap that shut. So that's an airtight bag. You can buy these pretty much any place. Walmart, I'm sure Menards, Home Depot, whatever. And then in a lot of sporting goods stores, here's another one. This one here is made by MTM. It's an airtight container. This here has my, uh, I've got a couple scent lock fanny packs in here with some strap-on steps and stuff. But anyway, this here has a rubber liner around it, so this is airtight as well. Plano also makes, I was in Menards the other day, and Plano also makes some airtight totes. I think they were around 40 or 50 bucks. That was in Menards, but I'm sure Home Depot and Lowe's has that as well. Now my scent lock, this scent lock tote here has this carbon absorber pad in it, and that's it came with it, because this one this is old. Um, they still sell those, but they're not necessary. I've got several totes that I don't have them in, and it hasn't made any difference. Uh, this is a scent lock, scent lock airtight bag. Just a big zipper bag that holds clothes. And again, the, the best way to tell if something's airtight, if you put your hand on the inside and just blow on it, if you can't blow air through it, it's airtight. Other than possibly the zipper. So that's the same with clothing. If you got clothes, if you're walking around in a store and you see something and it says it's windproof or waterproof, you know, to prove it to yourself, if you take your hand, slide it up the sleeve, put your mouth on the outside of the sleeve and try and blow air through it. If you can blow air through it, that does not have a membrane in it. It's not going to be waterproof. Because if it's waterproof or windproof, not wind resistant or water resistant, if it's waterproof or windproof, it has some, some form of membrane or plastic or Teflon between the exterior fabric and your body to totally 100% block rain and wind. Now concerning showering, Showering is not an absolute necessity. As long as you're wearing Scentlock when you're hunting, as long as you have it on as your exterior, anything that's on underneath it, if it has a little bit of odor in it, it doesn't make any difference. The, the deactivated carbon is gonna absorb it. It's not gonna go through it. So, uh, so, so keep that in mind, because tip a lot of times, I don't shower in the mornings. Uh, probably half the time I go out in the mornings. I, I shower before I go to bed, um, and then I just get up and go. So you don't have to shower. In fact, you could get out of work even if you worked in a factory. Uh, if you get out of work, you could basically go hunting and you know, s step into your scent lock clothing and you'll be fine. You know, sweating is way worse than, than having odors on your clothes, you know, some minor work odors or whatever on your clothes because the carbon's gonna absorb that. Sweating is something you do on your entire body. So it, you know, you're sweating on your face and part of your face is gonna be exposed when you're hunting. So that's not a good thing. Um, you know, I've never hunted in 90 degree weather. I get emails on that all the time. Uh, I know I, I shouldn't say I know, but I'm pretty sure I could figure it out if I had to deal with it. I've hunted in 75 and 80 degree weather. Um, and I just go in with, uh, you know, Icebreaker again. I mentioned that all the time. Uh, Icebreaker makes Merino wool t-shirts. In fact, This here is a tote where I just have undergarments, like underwear, t-shirts. This is an icebreaker long sleeve tee, so it's extremely lightweight. 
and I have some other ones, short sleeve tees that I wear, and a lot of times on when it's really, really warm out, uh, and that's always on an evening on, you know, I'll just wear a t-shirt and a pair of real thin underwear as long as I'm walking through an open area. Uh, let's say I have to cross a field or an open short weed field or something, you know, I'll just go in as light as I possibly can and I'll have my scent locking stuff in my backpack. And then I will, once I get to a place where I know I'm going to have to start dealing with vegetation and brushing against things, that's when I'll put on my scent lock suit. So I try to keep as light as I possibly can. And obviously, if you're going to hunt warm weather, you're going to want the Savannah lightweight suit. I would also suggest if you're dealing with warm weather, you get the Savannah, I think it's called a quick fire coverall. Because that quick fire coverall for warm weather, it's a union suit. It's a one-piece suit. So you can basically pull your arms out of the sleeves and you can roll it down and you know with your scent lock gloves on and then tie the arms around your waist so your upper body could be completely naked uh, so you know and you can't get any cooler than that by being totally naked and then once you get to vegetation then obviously you're probably going to want you'll have to pull that up and put it on and then you know zip up the front because when you brush against vegetation you don't want to leave any human odor on it but this is this is a tote that I carry. Just uh, my my basically my lightweight undergarments, my underwear, my socks, uh, tees. This here's some stuff. This is extremely lightweight. This is paper thin. Uh, this was made by oh god I can't remember the name Metalist, and this is called Silver Max. This actually has silver threads throughout it, just liners of silver thread in it. And silver is an antimicrobial, so this is not only lightweight, this antimicrobial, which is permanent, because silver will not wash out like an antimicrobial treatment, which is what most of the stuff is that says antimicrobial. Uh, silver is pretty awesome because if it's worn against the skin, it'll actually kill the bacteria, which is one of the hundreds of odors that emit from your body. Bacteria is actually an organism and this kills it so it doesn't multiply as fast. It doesn't do anything to absorb the odors from the dead bacteria, but it does help kill it so it doesn't multiply as rapidly. So if you're going to get something that's an antimicrobial, antimicrobials in an exterior garment are worthless. That's like spraying for ants outside your house when you got problems with ants inside your house. For the antimicrobial to work, it's got to be against your skin. It's got to come in contact with the actual bacteria. You can't put on a merino wool base or a cotton tea base and then another layer and then an exterior suit that's got an antimicrobial treatment. It's, it's three layers away from your skin. So it's not coming into contact with the bacteria, so it's not doing much to do anything about it. So keep that in mind. Exterior garments that have antimicrobial treatments, it's nice, it sounds cool, but it does pretty much nothing. That was a long sleeve camo. These are metalists too. Same exact technology. I don't know if you can see it, but there's little silver threads throughout that. And the cool thing about that is you can wash this as much as to your heart's content in scent-free detergent, and that silver is never going to go away. It's always going to be an antimicrobial. Antimicrobial treated garments, after you wash them a few times in scent-free detergent, the, you're going to wash away the treatment so that it doesn't work anymore. And again, that has to be worn against the skin to be functional. I keep my socks in here. Most of my socks are merino wool socks. I've got icebreaker socks. I've got some scent lock merino wool socks. Um, but you don't have to wear scent lock socks. So I get that asked once in a while. Your feet are actually inside of a pair of boots that do not breathe, whether it be neoprene or rubber. So having scent lock socks means pretty much nothing. You can wear any kind of sock you want. And I just find merino wool socks to be a lot more comfortable than a lot of other socks. Merino is a pretty unique fiber. Uh, merino sheep are ra primarily they're raised in New Zealand, um, and they're raised in altitudes over 5,000 feet. So they're raised in an area where there's no flies. 
So that's the difference between merino wool and regular wool is merino wool doesn't itch because there's no flies where they live. And therefore, they're, you know, when they get poop on them from rolling around in poop or whatever, they got it coming down the back of their fibers before they get sheared. And the flies, you know, in, in lower, lower elevations on, with regular wool, the flies will nip at the actual um, poop or urine or whatever and that puts little barbs in the actual wool fibers. So then when they shear the sheep and they blend all the, all the wool fibers together, you know, a lot of those fibers have got little barbs on them, just like on a fish hook. So when you wear it, that's what makes it prick. But because Merino sheep are raised in elevations where there are no flies, they don't have any, they don't prick and they don't itch because they don't get bit on. Uh, also, merino wool is a finer fiber. It's a little bit more curly of a fiber. And because in those higher elevations, they deal with colder winters and they deal with hotter summers because they're up higher. The sun, sun heats them up hotter in the daytime and in winter they get colder. So merino wool is a better insulator than regular wool and it's also better at keeping you cool than regular wool. It works, merino wool works both ways. It actually keeps you cool and it, and it actually is an insulator as well. So merino wool is an awesome, awesome garment. I, I wear almost 100% icebreaker merino wool on my base against my skin. Unless it's really early season and then I'll wear that metalist stuff with the silver, silver lining in that real lightweight stuff because I'm profusely sweating and that helps kill the bacteria in the actual perspiration. This sounds really complicated, but it's really not. Once you get this method down, it's really simple. So this is gonna be the process when you actually get to where you're hunting. I, I drive everywhere I hunt. I don't hunt, never hunted by my house. You never wear your scent lock when you're driving. It's always, once it comes out of the dryer, it goes in an airtight container, and it stays in that airtight tight container until you physically are gonna go out of the vehicle and go hunting. So you don't wear it in the car, you don't wear it getting gas, you don't wear it in restaurants. <laughs> uh, I see people in restaurants during hunting season with scent lock on quite frequently and it just amazes me and then they wonder why they might get winded. Um, so anyway, you, you have to take care of it. And then once you stop the vehicle, what I do is I take off my street clothes and then I will put on whatever base garments I'm going to be wearing, whether it be that lightweight metalist stuff with the silver in it or you know, an icebreaker, merino wool, wool base. And then once I get that on, I will actually wash my hands white with a wet wipe with a Pampers or a Huggies scent-free wipe. And then I'll put on my, I'll open up this. This is where my backpack and gear is. Excuse my little dough thing. And I always keep my scent lock gloves on top because I want to put them on first after I wipe my hands down. So I put my scent lock gloves on, and then I basically dress. I'll grab my, I won't grab my scent lock tote because I'm organized and in my van it's right there. I've got three totes and they're all right there handy. Just grab with your each for whatever one I want. But I'll open up the top of my, that's not supposed to be in there. I'll open up the top of my scent lock tote where, where my suits are actually at and I'll get out whichever suit I need for that particular hunt. Now this is an early season suit. This is a Savannah two-piece suit. And I handle, I try to handle everything with gloves, my scent lock gloves on, whether it be my sticks and aiders and everything. Once I put on my base garments that I put the gloves on, handle everything with my scent lock gloves on. Get dressed. This is another badass thing. I, I've actually worn these hunting. They don't make these anymore, but scent lock used to in their base layers, even their lightweight base layers, they had the exact same carbon liner as they do in their exterior garments. So you could actually hunt in warm weather with their lightweight base layers only. And I still own some of those. Here's, that's a bottom and this is a top. I think I have two sets of those still. But I usually have two, possibly three suits in my tote my scent lock clothing and it's labeled scent lock suits take 
once I get my snow lock jacket, pants on, I've got my gloves on, I don't put my head cover on until I get in the tree and I'm physically starting to hunt. I've got my snow lock backpack here. This is in its own tote. It also says backpack and accessories. So I've got extra head covers in here. I've got extra gloves. And I've got my backpack. And this is a scent lock backpack. This is a custom backpack that I had made. This was a pack. I remember what I had that in there for. I had this, I ordered this because uh, I wanted to see what one of their packs looked like. So this is a rogue backpack. They redesigned it. It's a lot quieter than it used to be. It's a lot nicer. So this is this is a new, even though it's an old model, it's been totally redesigned and it's a lot better than it used to. So this is a Sunlock pack. That's one you can actually buy. You can't buy these. This is, again was custom made uh, back a few years ago. One of the girls that worked there that did the fabrics, uh, I asked her to send me some fabric and she did and I sent some uh, fabric out to Kathy Kelly Designs. I think she's in Idaho or Idaho or Utah. And she made me a few of these Sunlock backpacks, which is awesome. And hopefully for 2023, um, hopefully Sunlock will do something like that for me too. Cause I, this is just a badass backpack, man. It's super quiet, big pocket and two, two little side pockets and one front main pocket. Now I keep my saddle. This is my saddle and my lead is on here. This is a modified ESS. So this is my whole deal. This has got the lead strap on it as well as the saddle. And then I have a lineman rope. Some knee pads. I carry all my layering garments in here. Uh, I actually have a video out on what I carry in my hunting pack, so I'm not going to waste your time showing you that. But anyway, I keep all of my layering garments, my calls, my water bottle, my pee bottle, my range finder, everything's in my backpack and it's in its own tote. So it's in its own airtight tote along with my binoculars and some extra accessories. Now this tote, I carry four totes in my van but three of them are usually accessible, one's buried in the back and it's that one. This is my insulated undergarments. So this little one, which is not airtight, this is all lightweight. This was that metalist with the silver in it, t-shirts, really lightweight, long sleeve tees, socks. But this is my insulated stuff. So this is a Rivers West insulated waterproof jacket. I use this as a layering garment. Uh, a lot of times if I'm wearing a permeable scent lock suit like a full season or even a savannah, this is always in my pack. I always have one of these in my backpack. And if it starts to get windy and chilly, you know, I'll put one of these on to, to block the wind. Or if it's raining, I'll, if I think it's gonna rain, I've got one of these that's also camo. I'll put that in my backpack and then if it starts raining, I'll actually take that off out and put it on over my, over my scent lock jacket. I don't worry about my legs because if my legs get wet, it's not a big deal. I worry about my upper body. I have several of these heated vests. These are these are just bad. These are just badass. That's all I can say. If anybody doesn't have a heated vest, that's definitely an investment you should, without question, make. Here's another heated vest. But anyway, in here I have some Primaloft uh, vests. I've got a Primaloft uh, layering jacket. So this here is what I use when it's, I, I, I re rearrange this throughout the season depending on how late it's getting in the year for more heavy, heavily insulated clothing. Early season it's got light insulated stuff, later season it's got heavy. And again, this is labeled insulated undergarments. Now I forgot to mention it, but my ESS hybrid is in my backpack. So I don't wear it until I get to the base of the tree. Once I get to the base of the tree, that's when I put, put that on and uh, if I have to prep the tree, then I put out, get out the lineman rope and prep the tree. If it's a pre-prep, I usually just climb up it and hook up. Now a lot of guys 
they wear their saddles through the woods so it's not something they have to put in their backpack to take up the space. Mine's considerably smaller than everybody else's. As long as you wash your saddle before season and let it air dry outside and leave it outside for a few days to air dry and air out, when you put it on, you're handling it with your Sunlock gloves on. And keep in mind, if even if you're wearing it, you're wearing it over top of your scent lock clothing. So it's not getting any odors on it. As long as you handle it with your scent lock gloves, once you've washed it in Semperi detergent and hung it outside to dry so it doesn't have odor on it, it's always on the exterior of your scent lock suit so it's not getting any odors on it. It's not like you're wearing it against your underwear or something. So, you know, you may want to wash it one more time halfway through the season or something like that, but... Uh, you know, really, it, there, there's no odors can get on it because nothing passes through your, your clothing to get onto the actual saddle. Concerning my boots, uh, I carry probably eight to ten pair of different boots in the back of my van, and uh, they're all duplicates. So I'll have two non-insulated pair of muck boots. I'll have two medium mid-weight muck boots. I'll have some insulated lacrosse boots, uh, not pack boots, but just, you know, have, I don't know, 1,200 gram, pencil, whatever. Uh, and then I will also have, if, if it's getting colder, I'll have two pair of the same kind of pack boots. And I own probably eight pair of pack boots. And I always like to have two pair in case, let's say I go out in the, on a morning hunt and I'm not near home and my boots get wet, the interior from perspiration, you know, and I don't have any way of drying them out. I don't want to have to put dry socks back into a damp interior boot for an evening hunt. So I always carry two of the same types of boots. That way I can wear the other pair that are dry inside and I'm going to have dry socks and I'm going to have a dry interior of my boot when I go hunting. And then that night, you know, I always carry um, boot dryers with me. I'll dry both pairs out. So I'm always, I always have dry boots when I go hunting. I hate putting on a pair of wet boots because if it gets cold and your socks are damp, your feet are going to get cold really fast because moisture just conducts cold or heat much faster than just air. And my boots, I just throw them in the back of the van. I don't do anything special with my boots. And once I put on my, my scent lock pants and then I slide my boots on, my pant legs drape over top of the boot. So that way, every time you move your foot, even if you're not walking, every time you move your foot, you're displacing air out the throat of that boot up at the top because there's no air that can get out anyplace else. So that, you're, with your pant leg draping over the top of that boot, probably 14 to 16 inches, you've got plenty of pant leg with activated carbon in it to absorb any odors before it gets out the bottom of the pant leg. And keep in mind, activated carbon, when it is actually made, you know, through the heating process and with no, with under pressure, it actually creates a bonding. The molecules actually come in and are, they are attracted to the activated carbon and it, and it makes a bond. So it's not like there's just something free falling and it's got to hit a certain spot to, to grab. The molecules are actually attracted to bonding to the activated carbon. If you leave the vehicle and you got your pants draped over the top of your boots, you know, you're probably only going to have your pant legs are going to be that high off the ground. So obviously if you get to a spot where you've got to go through some water, you know, ankle above your, just slightly above your ankle, you know, take your pant legs and just roll them up and roll them up inside out. So the carbon's on the outside. Just roll them up to the top of the boot, then go through the water. When you get through, just pull it back down. Pull it back down, and again, you got your sunlock gloves on. So, don't let don't let water stop you. <laughs> you, know, you don't want to get the bottom of your pants wet if you don't have to. And again, you always this is really really important. I can remember there was a guy on Sunlock's pro staff, and he would not he didn't wear his sunlock suit till he got to his tree. That is absolutely asinine. If you're hunting any kind of pressured property, you're going through some form of vegetation on your entry route. You're touching something. Because if you're not in an area where there's security cover and you're pursuing mature bucks, your odds are not very high killing anything because they are security cover oriented. So you always need to have on your ex, you know, your exterior suit, your exterior pieces, garments have to be sunlock. 
when you're going to go through any type of vegetation where you're brushing against branches, you're going through cattails, going through marsh grasses, going through autumn olive, going through red brush, whatever the case may be. You've got to have your exterior piece as your scent lock. That way, if you touch stuff, or when you touch stuff, because you're going to touch it, you're not going to leave odor on it. I have deer come through where I've walked through and I've touched vegetation. I have it happen all the time, and they don't even sniff on it. So, you know, and back before I did scent lock, man, oh man, if I touched any vegetation and I had a big mature doe come through, she'd smell that and she'd turn around and leave. So it was a big deal back then. I had to really be cautious on my entries so I didn't touch anything. I don't worry about that anymore as long as I'm touching it with my exterior scent lock suit. Now I do not wear a head cover. My head is totally exposed when I'm walking in on my entries. So keep that in mind. Because if you wear a head cover, you're just gonna perspire profusely. Um, I don't put my head cover on until I'm physically up in the tree and I'm starting to hunt. My body's cooled down, I've changed out some layers possibly. Then I, that, my head cover is the last thing to go on before I actually hunt because I actually tuck it down into the, into the top of the jacket. I don't have it draped outside of the collar. It's, it's tucked down inside. And you have to have a clean backpack. So if you don't have a Sunlock backpack and they are pricey, they're 100, 150 bucks, and you've got a backpack, that's fine. But make sure you wash it. You know, it's porous, it's fabric, it's got to be washed in scent-free detergent. And just like I put my scent lock backpack in an airtight tote, if you wash a backpack that you, you're using, you know, it needs to go in an airtight tote as well. Because it's going to be absorbing odors otherwise, if it's not in something airtight. If I get to my tree and I have perspired, I always carry an extra base garment with me. 100% of the time, I never go hunting without an extra base garment with me. And I always carry one, one and a half gallon Ziploc bag in the bottom of my backpack. So once I get to the tree, I climb up the tree. If my bottom layer is damp, I'll take off my jacket, hang it up someplace, take off that t-shirt or whatever it is. And, you know, I'll put it in that gallon and a half Ziploc baggie, seal it shut, make it as small as possible, seal it shut, and then I'll put on... As soon as my body cools off and dries off, I'll probably wipe it off with some scent-free scent wipes, which I always have in my bag. Whoops, wrong one. I always have a bag of scent wipes. These are just Pampers, you know, hypoallergenic scent-free wipes. So I'll, you know, once I take off my jacket, my tea, put that in this gallon and a half Ziploc bag, put it in my thing. I wipe my body down and as soon as it dries there dries it off uh, then I'll put on the clean tea so I got a dry dry tea. I do the same thing with my face before I put on the head cover. If my face has been perspiring I'll wipe it down with a couple of them actually and then those ones that I've used I also carry some additional quart Ziploc baggies in my backpack as well. I'll take those used scent wipes and I'll put them in a Ziploc bag and put them in the backpack as well. And then I let my face dry off, then I put the head cover on. Something else a lot of people don't think about is skeeters, mosquitoes. Um, mosquitoes are attracted to your carbon dioxide odor. And when you're wearing scent lock, mosquitoes are a non-issue. Uh, I can remember before I wore scent lock, I can remember hunting some times where the mosquitoes just drove me absolutely crazy. Um, and since I've been using scent lock, the only thing that's exposed is right here. I've got scent lock cover in my nose, in my mouth, in my entire body. Once in a while, I'll have a mosquito, you know, fly around my eyes, but it's really, really rare. Mosquitoes are a non-issue anymore. Uh, once you wear a scent lock, they become a total non-issue. Now, this is my waterproof stuff. So, scent lock hasn't, in my opinion, made the best waterproof garments. I don't, they, everything they have has fixed hoods, which I absolutely hate fixed hoods. And, uh, and their stuff tends to be a little bit noisy. Now, this, the saddle hunter suit, my signature suit for saddle hunting, that is gonna have a polyurethane membrane, which is a waterproof membrane in it, but that's got a deep napped fleece on the exterior to mask the noise of it. Most of the other stuff they make does not. Uh, I shouldn't say most, some of it doesn't. Some of their lighter weight waterproof stuff, you know, it's got a micro fleece exterior, so it's kind of noisy. But River, everything Rivers West does has a really dense 
and deep nap fleece on the exterior. So I've got a lot of Suntlock stuff that I wear if it's raining. If it's physically raining, when I'm going to leave my vehicle, I'll have my Suntlock on underneath it, and this will be my exterior. Once I wear a suit, a Rivers West suit, one time, so let's say it's raining, I put it on over top of a Suntlock suit, so this is going to be my exterior. This is washed in scent free detergent. As soon as it comes out of the dryer, it's in this airtight tote, just like my scent lock. Once I use this one time, obviously it's going to be wet. So I don't just throw this in the dryer and then dry it out and throw it back in this tote. No. Once this is used one time, it gets washed in scent free detergent. It gets dried and then it goes right, then it goes into the tote. So I never put anything that I've used once back in this tote to contaminate the stuff in here that's pristine clean. I always wash it before I put it back in here. And Rivers West is a one and done. Once I use it one time, it gets washed and then it goes back in here. And this is one, this is something I designed for Rivers West. And it's one reason I love Rivers West. Uh, this is a waterproof hat and it's designed where you don't have a hood and basically this big back lip on the back, that overhangs your collar so when it rains it's got a short bow hunting bill. When it rains the water just hits this and runs off the back. And it's also got an adjustment strap on the back for different size heads. And it also has really thin, really thin elastic earmuffs that pop down out of it. And believe it or not, it doesn't take much to keep your ears warm. Just that little bit of fabric covering your ears will definitely keep I actually designed a suit for Rivers West back in 2005. It's called the Ambush Jacket, and it is still their number one selling uh, waterproof jacket. And it won the 2005 Field and Stream Best of the Best Garment Award that year, so that was kind of cool. And that was designed for bow hunting. For all day sits, if I'm going to be toting any food in, which I always do if I'm going to sit all day, I'll usually take two apples and I'll three or four granola bars and I'll take in some Hershey bars and I'll take the granola bars out of the wrappers because the wrappers are really noisy out in the field. Uh, so are the Hershey bars. So, so I'll take them out of the wrapper, I'll put them in a Ziploc uh, quart freezer bag and that way the bag's real quiet to open and I can eat what I want and seal it back up. And I don't have any wrappers to deal with because I took them off. And as far as the apples go, I eat the apples and then when I get down to the core, the core does not go on the ground. Okay, the cord goes in another Ziploc bag and sealed shut and goes in my backpack. So I don't like having the odor of apples in an area where there are no apple trees. Because a big buck in a pressured area, if there's something out of the ordinary there odor wise, uh, there's an excellent chance he'll turn around and leave. If he knows that ain't supposed to be there, it's not cool. You know, where I'm, when I go out west, it's not a big deal. Nothing's a big deal out there. But here, it's a big deal. So everything has to be done correctly. It, it, there's nothing like Sunlock. You know, Sunlock owns a patent on activated carbon. Uh, nobody else can use it unless they pay them a royalty. Uh, you know, there's lots of other stuff out there. I've never used a hex suit. I get asked about that once in a while, but I've, I know guys that have had them and they haven't had that good of luck with them. Uh, as far as the sprays, they're a joke. Sodium bicarbonate and water, which is basically baking soda and water, that is an absolute joke. I laugh my butt off when I see a TV guy spritzing himself with spray and that's going to keep him scent free. That is not going to happen. Ever. I mean, they even pay attention to the wind and they even say it on shows usually. Well, which way is the wind blowing? And Well, if you're spritzing down and you're supposed to be scent free, what do you care what way the wind's blowing? Trust me, that stuff does not work. Uh, sodium bicarbonate does have a minute amount of odor absorptive capacity, but it's very small. They do use it in refrigerators to you know, keep the foul odors out of your refrigerator, but it's a very minute amount of uh, adsorptive capacity. Um, so it's, it's nothing remotely in the same earth <laughs> as, as activated carbon. Um, I've told you all ever, I've, I've mentioned what activated carbon is, so I, I really wish anybody would look up the technology because it's used in so many things, it's just unreal. Anyway, I'm trying to walk you through the processes and just to keep in mind, if you want to have a good scent control regimen where wind is totally irrelevant, you have to pay attention to the details. 
again, a lot of people just are not capable, they're just not detail oriented enough to do a scent control regimen, even if they wanted to, it's just not in their DNA. So if you are a detail oriented pe a person, and I know a lot of you are, I've talked to tons and tons of hunters, I can tell talking on a phone if the guy's a detail oriented person. Uh, let alone seeing them and seeing their personal hygiene or their vehicle. Uh, the scent control thing works. It's worked for me for 20 plus years. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to pass the technology on to you guys to make you become better hunters. It sounds like a lot, but once you do it, everything's automatic. I mean, you don't even think about it. Once you do it for a year or two, and if something goes wrong, you think to yourself, okay, what happened? You know, I can remember one one time, my son Chris, he told me he went out hunting and he had a new re wrist release. He had a new release and he didn't wash it. And he had, he had a doe come in and actually downwind and she winded that release. And when he actually lifted it up and, because he was thinking to himself, God, I've done this for years without worrying about ever getting busted. What did I do? What, what did I, what's not, normal that I've normally done and he thought about that release and he he could smell it himself actually when he reached out and lifted his arm up and smelled it he could smell it and I can remember another time I this was happened to me it, it was a decent buck but it probably wasn't a buck I would have shot but it was in Michigan and it was on public land and it was on an all-day sit and it was around noon one o'clock ish somewhere in there I didn't look at my watch but it was midday and I was, I had actually taken off my head cover because I was starting to overheat a little bit. And, and I also wanted to eat an apple. So I took off my head cover and all of a sudden I looked up and there's a buck downwind of me, probably 60 yards staring right at me, staring right at the tree. I mean, and, and he eventually, he didn't snort. He just turned around and trotted back off. Uh, and there's no question whatsoever, you know, when I took off my head cover, I'd had it off probably three or four minutes and, and he winded me. 40% of your odor comes out of your head. So, you know, when you watch TV guys and they don't wear head covers, they wear stupid ball caps with face paint and hair hanging out everywhere. Um, you know, that doesn't work. Works where they're at because everything works where they're at. They got so many bucks, it doesn't make any difference. Um, but I promise you, if you put some time into this and you learn the process, you get some airtight containers, doesn't have to be, it could be a plastic bag, it could be a garbage bag, you know, as long as you keep it tied at the top. Containers are kind of nice because you don't have to worry about puncturing holes in them as easy. They're, and also you can stand on them, you can sit on some of these containers. So they're perfect for the back of my vehicle because I sit on them while I'm getting into the other ones. Um, but anyway, uh, I'm sure I'll get some negative things just like everybody there's always some naysayers that don't believe anything and uh, I expect that because they're lazy uh, lazy people tend to knock down everything that they can't physically do so bring it on you know I don't have anything to gain out of this yeah I'm gonna make a little bit of money on this Suntlock suit this year the signature suit but it's the first time I've ever gotten any money from Suntlock and I've been promoting them for 20 some years so I'm not doing it for the money. Trust me, I'm not. I'm, I'm very, not very well off, but I'm okay. I'm retiring at the end of the year and I've got some side stuff going on and uh, I'm okay. So I'm not worried about the money. I just want people to be more successful because you put so much time into it. But anyway, I'm, I could sit here and blab forever. So I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, put them on the, put them on the uh, reply and I'll see what I can do. I tried to cover everything as good as I could, as fast as I could, because there's so much to cover, uh, but I'm sure I missed some things. So, hey, thanks for watching. I appreciate it.